the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit regalassets.com. We are back from vacation. We needed some time to detox and decompress in the Florida sunshine. And with me now is Danielle Park, whose kids just started their first day of school, and she feels a burden has been lifted from her shoulders, <laughs> even though the- I don't know if you're allowed to admit that, Carrie. <laughs> You can admit it as a parent who went through many years of it, but the <laughs> economic burden that we're all facing is increasing. Hey, Danielle, how you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm amazed it's September, and it's very hot up here today, and our air conditioning's not working. But all that aside, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't really do much about the weather other than stay inside. But, you know, I realized that I haven't been on a vacation really since uh, last Christmas and going to Texas for Christmas is not a vacation. What I also realized is I hadn't been to the beach or been outside, just hanging outside for a couple of days. And I realized after doing it a couple of weeks ago in Florida that I probably had a vitamin D deficiency. So now I'm like totally pumped, got my son for the past three days, four days. I just stayed outside, walked around and just had a incredibly great time and now my batteries are recharged and i'm back ready to face all the mess that's going on in the world again boy do we have a mess this world economy is uh, sinking faster than uh, charlie sheen in rehab huh <laughs> yeah it is the um the manufacturing data you know again the global pmi is now 80 percent of the world economies are contracting and August U.S. manufacturing PMI down below 50, third month in a row, lowest since July 2009. You know, so we've had indicators of this for the last six months that it was incoming and uh, nothing seems to be changing that thesis. I think, you know, when we look back on this historically, I think we'll have seen that the recession in the U.S. probably started indeed in July or so of this, this summer. And what's the solution but to print money? And I just want to point out one article you had a link to on jugglingdynamite.com today, which really summed the whole thing up. China's steel traders expose banks' bad debts, and yeah. it's about their stimulus. It's good to know that we're not the only ones that uh, that just blow money in a stimulus. You've got all these steel companies that owe a total of about 400, oh no, there it is, $629 billion or something like that, that they can't afford to pay back. Isn't that a it shock? Exactly, because the, it's just like in the um, U.S. banking system when the Federal Reserve and TARP and all these things force capital into the system with no really good opportunities evident, nothing really compelling on an investment thesis, you know, slowing demand, and you can contrive everything you want, but if a business owner doesn't see a, a reasonable opportunity for profit, they're not going to just, you know, use money for nothing. So you actually have to have some... Uh, climate or incentive or something that's attractive to attract that capital. So it's sitting there, the liquidity on bank balance sheets, you know, um, and, and the same thing happened in China. So what, what I think we've made, what I think a lot of people did wrong the last couple of years is they looked at the resumption in demand in China from the bottom, you know, coming out of 09 as a bounce back that was a sign that we were all back to the, the consumer-led economy and everything was good. And in fact, I think it was just a, a, a feature of of liquidity flooding through and people speculating in various things like commodities and, and uh, in you know even in the stock market you saw a big pop in Chinese stocks but now that's been deflating again and they're back to you know the 2000 level on the Shanghai composite is about where it was in the the 
you know, March of 2009 time frame. So we're, we're only about 300 points above the all-time bottom in that cycle, which was uh, in November of 2008. And I keep saying, you know, this this is a harbinger of uh, things to come potentially for the rest of the world markets, even though the U.S. has been, you know, again, rallied the last couple of months on all this nonsense out of the Fed and the Bernanke put talk, et cetera. But you see that it's actually this whole deflating demand story, Terry, is just a key theme. And you see it everywhere you look. You know, even the the uh, ISM composite in the last little while, the inventories are rising while so the orders are contracting. You know, so that's a feature of too much stuff, too much capacity, and that's not likely to lead to you know new jobs anytime soon. Right, and the Baltic Dry Index. I don't know if you caught that one. Is getting close again to closing in on all time lows, and like you said. The demand isn't there because the people don't have the money. In the U.S., the consumer is a basket case. He's tapped. He's uh, paying interest on interest. And if the demand isn't in the U.S., and certainly it isn't in uh, the EU, uh, they're blowing up like before our very eyes, and we're going to see massive monetary destruction. So the question is, do they print and pray, or do they just throw up their hands and let the whole thing collapse? It's not human nature to just sit back and watch something blow up. Human nature, the way it is now, always the government has to do something. You have to they fix it. They want to look it. busy, right? Yeah. Everyone wants to look busy. I find that with portfolio managers, too. They're all worried about looking busy, like they're you know, buying things up for people. Well, what if the prices are horrible? What if it makes no sense on an investment thesis to, to buy things at current levels? You know, most people are still trying to look busy regardless. Um, and you see that with governments. And I think you even see that out of the uh, the Federal Reserve. You know, you got Bernanke saying from Jackson Hole that, that there's more can, that can be done. Yeah, sure, there's more that can be done. But at this level of rates with this amount of liquidity, you know, when you've already expressed that you'll keep rates low to 2014. So go ahead, say 15, you know, like throw something else out there. But I think that the main theme is that this slowing demand, this slowing global economy is something that tweaking the monetary conditions a little at this point is very likely to have any, no impact on at all. So he can promise, he can jawbone. You've got Draghi in the Eurozone today, you know, pulling a, pulling a, a Hank Paulson maneuver to, to saying to the EU, you know, if you guys don't start, you know, if you don't bring out the big guns now, it's all going to go down the, the pooper. But you know what? It already went down the pooper. That's the truth. And I think more people are understanding now that it's been in the, the doldrums for a long time and all we've done is tried to gloss it over with more debt and it's now you know the gaskets are all kind of coming loose all over the system yeah so all this money printing we've never really gotten out of the crisis that started in 07 08 have we no we've never got out of the crisis on our metrics we had um favorable, you know, investment climate for a, probably a five-month period there coming out of the bottom of 09, and then we started to get overvaluations in most of the things that matter, um, you know, overzealous forecasts again from the analyst community. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of the, the, let's call them the, perhaps the economically privileged or the dim-witted, didn't understand <laughs> what was going on in the world. Um, some people have had enough money that they thought, how bad can it be for the average bear? I think now um, they're starting to appreciate that that we are in the midst of a um, secular shift in mentality and behavior and habits, and that that will dramatically impact what the future is going to look like for the next 10 or so years. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting because all of the technology technological trends are all pretty much going against this demand creation thing and higher rates of productivity, different types of work environments. It all really is against what they're trying to do. They really are pushing on a string, trying to make things work in a way that they can anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, and I think that the, the models have to be really revamped and thrown out. And, um, you know, I think this is a big month for September. is a huge month for the Eurozone. You know, we had uh, Angle and Merkel and company on holidays in, in August, and you had very little news. And so you saw the algo traders ramping up little news to be, you know, trade it positively. So you saw price moves in a bunch of assets. Um, I mean, amazingly, in things like oil and gas, where you saw, you know, I think a 9% jump in in uh, crude in August alone carried, you know, just sure. when the, the 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 driving season's coming to an end and the U.S. consumer wasn't driving that much anyway, and now you've got this additional burden in the things that matter, like food and energy. And those things are going to continue to weigh down on people who have, you know, minimal cash flow to begin with. And, you know, I guess here's the thing that is an encouraging idea. Um, so sometimes people, I talk about, I've been talking about this for a few years, how the new normal is going to be global growth growth somewhere in the 3 to 4% range if we're lucky. Nothing like it was at the peak of the credit bubble when we had global growth knocking on the 5% door. You know, we're not going to see that kind of climate probably for a number of years. So people think that's a horrible idea. Oh, you know, that that means so depressing. That means we're going to have, you know, depression-like conditions for so long. Actually, it's quite feasible to survive on lower revenues if you are not servicing the same level of debt. And people maybe have experienced this in their own life. So if if an individual can pay down their debt such that they don't have that negative cash flow going out, it's amazing how less uh, you know, how much less income they can actually have the same standard of living or even increase their consumption as long as they can get the debt down. So you either get the debt down because you can pay it off by liquidating certain assets and, and getting ahead of the curve, or you get the debt off by a debt jubilee of some kind where, you know, you just walk away like I think is going to happen. In There's that country. word again, <laughs> jubilee, <laughs> that That's word right. again. But but it's just such a practical, you know, people can argue against that all day long, but 2,000 years of human history tells us that that's <laughs> the way we get out of these things. There is no other way. You and I have been talking about this for months, and yet um, the you talk about models not working. This international economic financial model is dead, all right, because it all depended upon ever-increasing amounts of debt to service the existing debt and to pay the interest. It's dead. It doesn't work. It's over. And yet there's this mass denial. Nobody wants to admit it because then, God forbid, you have to do something about it. You have to come up with a new system. And there is an inherent unfairness that the people that were the most irresponsible, that took on the most debt, will effectively get the most benefit from the jubilee but somebody's going to get screwed no matter what happens and it's better to create the new system in advance rather than have to do it on the fly in the from the ashes of the old one yeah, we have to reset, and um, we can reset. And that the good news is that even when humans are alive, even if they have less income, they're still going to demand products. They're still going to need things to consume, and that's not going to go away. We're knocking, you know, 7 billion people in the world. There is some demand there. It's just that we were so far above real demand for a number of years that all the models got premised on that insatiable uh, growth trajectory, which we aren't going to have now for a while. So practical solutions, you know, is just people have to get get downsizing their asset style, uh, spend less, build up their coffers again. And I think, you know, the way, if we're correct about this incoming recession, which again, for months now, that's been the thesis, but it seems to be confirmed with every new bit of data that we're getting here, then you should also get another valuable reentry point in terms of the stock market in the months ahead. Now, it could happen it within a couple of months and it could happen you know over the next few months but the point is there's a exciting time coming there for those who are proactive you know why do people have to sit there and get hammered and then you know hope that it comes back again and, and they go through it again it's horrible to see you know you aren't required to constantly hold your feet to the equity fire you can actually back out you can take your savings and park it on the side and when you do that you're you're in an amazingly strong position 
heading into these downturns. You don't have to be victimized by it. And I think that's a message that, that you know, the investment world never wants anyone to think that because if people start moving their money out of equities, then they lose their income flow. So they tell people all this harmful nonsense to keep them in harm's way. I think, you know, one of my passions is just to try and, you know, either deal with the world as it is and make adjustments so that you aren't, you know, totaled by it, or you deal with a fairy tale, and that's a very painful nightmare frequently. Oh, yeah. You know, it's denial on a mass scale, and the biggest deniers are the people who reap the biggest rewards from the financial sector that is going to crumble and be a mere shadow of its former self. And one can argue that that's probably for the the betterment of humanity because we get to that whole discussion of the real economy and the financial economy and the financial economy has been kind of sucking the life out of the real economy for way too long. Absolutely. And I think... You know, as I say, the the election results, we've talked about this before, no matter who gets in, I think America's facing a period of austerity, maybe not to the extent that some real conservatives believe, you know, maybe there's, there's a whole range of cuts that are possible from, you know, a lot aggressively to a little to start, but at the end of the day, it's less spending from government, and that's a key theme on both sides. So I, I'm not really full of great hope that they're going to do anything really brilliant. But on the other hand, it seems that we're coming to the end of the line of credit of this bailout mentality, and that in itself is progress. Well, we can only hope and pray. So, Danielle, we find you on jugglingdynamite.com and your other site? Venablepark.com. All right. To hear this, as well as the many other interviews Danielle and I have done together, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Danielle, we will talk to you in a couple of weeks. You be well. Thank you, Carrie. Bye. Take care.